So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria Valderrama. I'm from the Österreichische Nationalbank and I'm also one of the coordinators of the CHAMP network. Let me welcome you to the last session um, of business cycle monetary policy and long run effects. We have uh, two very interesting papers. The first one will be presented by Michaela Elsbacher-Schmöller um, and discussed by Paloma Lopez Garcia. Michaela, you have 30 minutes. Um, the floor is yours. Please start. And the paper is the recession slow technology growth evidence from the firm level. Yeah, so thank you very much for the kind introduction and in general for putting uh, the paper onto the program. And um, this is joint work together with Olga Golf and Frank and Tobias Schmidt from Bundesbank. And before I get started, the usual disclaimer applies that these are strictly our own views. Um, yeah, so to motivate this line of research, so. I mean, if you look into the drivers of uh, technology growth, uh, if you look into the insights from endogenous, uh, endogenous growth theory, it's well established that the main driver of long run growth is technology growth, and in turn, its main determinant is investment in innovation. However, if you look into how we typically in the standard workhorse models of cyclical fluctuations treat technology, uh, treat technology dynamics, is that we, in almost all cases, abstract from modeling technology dynamics endogenously in general equilibrium. And what technology usually means is that, it, that we model it in the form of, of a shock, of an AR1 process, um, which implies that, um, exo uh, that technology is generally exogenous in these frameworks. And, um, um, but at, at the same time, it also is an important driver of TFP, uh, this technology shock, but we don't really know what is behind it and what it means. And um, while this is a very wide assumption, it also has very substantial implications. So one point is that um, cyclical fluctuations do not influence, and this is by assumption, innovation and technology dynamics and ultimately uh, the dynamics of total factor productivity. And what this means is that business cycles are usually a short-term phenomenon um, and um, basically with a strict dichotomy between cycle and trend di directly baked into the frameworks. Um, and um, what this paper does, um, we ask basically one key question, and this is do firms cut their investment in innovation in a recession? And if you look into, when you look into the insights from the previous literature and that typically um, the pro-cyclicality of innovation investment on the aggregate and of total factor productivity on the aggregate is uh, well established. And um, there are also frameworks uh, which incorporate the possibility of persistent effects of recessions uh, through a drop in technology enhancing investments, talking, of, for instance, about the um, medium-term business cycles uh, framework by Common and Gertler. And um, there's also increasing evidence that um, from aggregate time series that contractionary demand shocks have an impact on innovation dynamics and on TFP. Um, however, um, uh, with this main mechanism being that an economic contraction um, weighs on the incentive to invest in innovation um, because it decreases firm profits and the expected um, uh, benefit from innovating and this lowers innovation, investment, and technology growth. However, this is partially also tentative evidence because it's on aggregated data and on theory. And the challenges in general in the microdata is both identification and data availability when you look into, for instance, firm level data. Now, um, what we do in this paper, we present firm level evidence on the innovation investment patterns by firms in a crisis using a novel granular data set and we should also, um, from a theoretical side, we're also employing our theoretical framework, which um, shows um, from an aggregate perspective the persistent effects of these shocks. And um, so in case I'm running out of time, I want to show the three main results from, from, from this paper. Uh, quickly already in the beginning. So what we do is we estimate an elasticity between the crisis impact and the respective adjustment on the innovation investment side. So we show that firms which were adversely hit by the crisis are significantly more likely to cut their innovation investment. And we distinguish here between um, frontier innovation, um, R&D, and technological diffusion, which we uh, view as 
other innovation investment, which is not meant to be R&D, but uh, still meant to generate uh, innovation from the, from the viewpoint of the firm. And um, since we also have a cyclical measure of the crisis-induced output drop at the firm level, um, this permits us to estimate these elasticities at the firm level. And what we show is that um, for firms which cut their investment, we see a 1% uh, cyclical output drop, which translates in 0.2% um, 0.27% uh, decrease in R&D investment and 0.3% cut uh, in diffusion investment. And um, then we also go into the uh, concrete patterns of the um, firm level innovation adjustment patterns uh, at, at using the firm level data. And we show that um, there at the extensive margin, we see a drop in innovation expenditures uh, relative to pre-crisis plans because in the data we can identify both realized and pre-crisis uh, plan investment. And we see on the extensive margin a cut in R&D investment in 25% of the firms and a cut in technological diffusion investment in 20% of the firms. At the intensive margin, um, this means like the cut that each firm on average undertakes compared to pre-crisis plans uh, are very substantial and equal to minus 65% for R&D and minus 70% uh, for uh, diffusion activities. And I mean, if you wanna put a number on it, this translates into large and economically substantial cuts, uh, which means for R&D on average 750,000 euros per firm and for diffusion um, nearly about a million. And um, what is also new to this data set is that we at the same time can identify the main underlying driving shocks, um, which means, and we show in this context, that, there, that in particular also demand shocks play a key role. And um, from that angle, I mean, if you look into how we typically think of um, technology in the new Keynesian model, uh, we also, and what identifying assumption we make in the new Keynesian model usually is that from, this, from the viewpoint of this research, we suggest that short run fluctuations do have an impact on uh, innovation and aggregate supply over at least the medium term. So, and if, for instance, like we can also show the role of expectations in this context, and if a firm expects issues with demand in the near future, then um, the, the probability to cut the innovation investment increases by 10 uh, percentage, uh, percentage points. And as we will see, this is a big marginal effect. We also show the role of financial frictions in this context, but mainly as an amplification mechanism. And, and since we will see that in the specific um, crisis episode that we have at disposal, uh, financial frictions were not the key mechanism here. We typically view the estimates that I just showed um, as a lower bound in this context. But in, for instance, if you talk about a financial crisis, you may expect a substantial amplification mechanism basically kicking in through the financial frictions. Um, yeah, so I will skip through the previous literature, but just set the scenes a little bit on what uh, episodes I'm talking about and what the aggregate statistics, um, uh, basically the key main series uh, look like in this context. So we have basically here, and I wanna add, I'm talking about a firm level data set, which is about Germany. Um, and uh, basically, and we talk about the adjustment period during the uh, COVID episode in 2020. And as you can see here from the real GDP side, this meant a substantial uh, drop uh, in real GDP, which is no news, but it also meant, uh, was associated with a very profound drop in business R&D investment at the same time. So this is um, what's going on in the aggregate. And now I'm jumping into what, uh, the firm level data set looks like that we're using here. So it's a large representative sample of firms, um, which is representative across sectors and size categories. And it's part of the Bundesbank online panel of firms. It's a representative monthly survey of firms in Germany. So this survey is undertaken regularly. And on top of that, we have fielded in um, our own innovation model, which covers in total 5,500 firms and in which and we asked firms in 2021 in the third quarter retrospectively um, for the episode of 2020. I mean, this is the episode that I'm focusing on today in any case. And um, as I said, we have the full distribution of firms across sizes, uh, size categories and sectors. 
and this is important to emphasize because it's not only about manufacturing firms and not only about big firms, but across the firm distribution. And um, this gives us a granular and unique joint firm level information on the following points. So whereas some other service may be able to capture some of the elements separately, there's no other survey which can study this jointly. So first of all, we have information on frontier innovation, on R&D, and non-frontier innovation, which we defer to as diffusion or technological adoption. And um, what we can do is we can identify uh, the crisis-induced adjustment at the firm level. So we have the realized investment and we have the pre-crisis plans. And taking this together, we can identify the cyclical crisis-induced downward adjustment for each of the firms we have in the sample. And we have information for both for the reasons for adjustment and for non-adjustment, which means we can give a detailed information, a detailed mapping on the underlying driving shocks we, which, which we have in this in, 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 at the firm level. And importantly, especially when thinking about elasticities, we also can measure the crisis-induced drop in production or in business activity at the firm level. In other words, we have a measure on the crisis exposure on each of the firms in the sample. And uh, in, in addition, we can use the detailed firm level characteristics and, and from, from a general firm level characteristic view, but we also have detailed information on financing, on financial frictions, as well as of the firm's expectations, um, both about their own expectations, about their own, the, the firm level specific outlook, but also about the macroeconomic outlook. And, um, yeah, so I will just show right away one of the main results here. So we, uh, what we show here is uh, the estimation result in which we map the crisis exposure and the innovation uh, investment cuts uh, together. So if you look into, uh, for instance, the first column, we see here the role that um, a crisis induced drop in uh, production and business activity has basically zero one. And what we see here that a firm uh, which observes a crisis induced drop in business activity is 11.6% more likely to uh, undertake a cut in innovation investment. And if you compare it um, to, uh, to technological diffusion, as you can see here in column five, um, the same measure is basically 8.5%. So on the extensive margin, so whether a firm adjusts or not, we see a stronger adjustment on the R&D side. And uh, in general, a pronounced uh, role of the, ro uh, basically, of the crisis uh, exposure variable, which is in both cases um, about half of the mean of the adjustment. And um, yes, yeah, so we can also uh, basically use the estimate direct uh, elasticities of uh, linking the crisis-induced uh, production or business activity drop and the respective magnitude of the downward adjustment in percent relative to plans for both uh, innovation margins. And here we see that um, for the case of R&D, if a firm adjusts and uh, like each uh, percentage point in the, in the drop in business activity at the firm level translates um, into um, an estimate of 15.8 and for uh, technological diffusion in, in, in 12. So this is, uh, this, these are the estimates of the, of the elasticities respectively. Oh no, sorry, I'm in the wrong one. So in general, you have to look into column, sorry for correction, you have to look into the column three and uh, seven here. So if you, the, and the interpre interpretation goes as follows, if you have a 1% drop of business activity, uh, in a firm which had plans for R&D and uh, decided to adjust, it translates into a 0.27 um, cu percentage cut in R&D investment. And for diffusion, this is relatively stronger pronounced, as you can see here, as uh, basically a one percentage drop in, uh, in, in business activity translates into a cut in diffusion investment of 0.3. So there's a stronger um, adjustment margin on the on the on the on the on the intensive side for adoption versus R and D, um, and yeah. So to give an a, a overview on the on the the, the the patterns across firms, like how this uh, like how firms uh, respectively adjust their in the, the innovation investment, and what we see for R and D 
is that already like looking into column two, what you see here is that for firms that did not plan any investment, very few started. So this is less than a percentage point basically that we're talking about. So all of the adjustment that you see on the innovation side um, occurs um, on the intensive margin. And um, as we see in the samples, so about 17% of the firms kept in, in investment unchanged. 25% decreased and 6% increased. But as we will see later, the uh, average adjustment on the increasing side is very small, whereas the, uh, the innovation cuts are very pronounced, which gives us um, on average um, in, the, in the sample very pronounced tendency towards cutting innovation investment. And then um, for technological diffusion, I mean, there's similar patterns on the, on the on the extensive margins of very few firms started to invest um, in uh, diffusion activities in response to the crisis um, and about 25, 20 percent um, cut their, you know, their, their innovation investment and about 4.6 percent um, increased. And um, well, um, you may also want to ask uh, those firms which did not um, undertake uh, any adjustment in, res in response to the crisis, to their innovation investment, what were the reasons for it? So we also have very detailed information on that margin. And um, as we can see here, um, if you go to the firms and ask them why they kept everything as, as, as it was planned before the crisis, you see that 46% uh, of the firms say they report that they did not expect experience a sufficiently strong change in their own economic conditions, which would have necessita necessitated such a change. And in other words, that means they were not hit by an adverse shock. Then we can also back out the role of uh, financial frictions of financial resources in that context, because another 33% say that while their economic situation has been changed, meaning that they had um, experienced an adverse shock, um, they had sufficient financial means to smoothen out that shock. And um, again, like then if you take together the, those firms which did not uh, adjust because of sticky investment, we have like about 10% which would have adjusted either up or down. But this is really small in comparison to the other reasons that we have here. And um, well, again, here we're showing basically this, I won't go through this in detail, but just to quickly summarize the main points here. Um, we can basically compute the average decrease for each firm and the, um, for, uh, for, for each margin of innovation. And as you can see here, the um, uh, adjustments are economically substantial, giving you an average adjustment for R&D of 750,000 euros and um, for technological diffusion about 900, 950,000. And as you can see also for both margins, the increases are very small, weighed out uh, uh, by uh, very pronounced cuts to innovation investment, um, which leaves us that the increases are very net negligible in, in, in magnitude compared to the, to the, to the uh, cuts in innovation investment. And uh, importantly also like to uh, relate it to the aggregates of what we document here in the, in the, in the survey is about a, a minus 9% average adjustment in R&D, which we can bring together to the, um, uh, which we will show are very close to the adjustment we actually see in business R&D investment in the aggregate, which is about compared to pre-crisis trend about minus 10%. So these figures are very close also when you aggregate them up to the aggregate dynamics. Now, um, again, like here we show the downward adjustment relative to plans so on the intensive margin. So as you can see, like for both um, R&D in the first uh, table and for technological diffusion, we see that like firms are obviously as firms uh, vary across size categories and other characteristics. The firms are heterogeneous in plans, but they're also heterogeneous in the extent of, um, of the innovation cuts. But on average, we have a mean adjustment in R&D of minus 65% and on average of minus 70 for technological diffusion activities. And um, yeah, importantly, we can also look into the, uh, the reasons and to the shocks um, that firms report why they undertook this downward adjustment. Uh, basically, we ask those firms which did undertake changes in their innovation investment, what were the reasons for it? And as we can see here, first of all, like the pattern for both types of shocks 
is that in a way, um, one direct observation is that both margins are driven by similar uh, driving shocks. And what we see is, and this is not surprising because it concerns the COVID episode, is also that the increase in uncertainty as in any uh, recession mattered a lot for the downward adjustment patterns. And importantly, also from the viewpoint of the new Keynesian models, that demand is one of the most important categories which have been mentioned by the firms as an as a important driving factor of um, this ad uh, adjustment pattern innovation. We also see to a minor extent a role for supply chain disruptions and um, the innovation investment cuts. And this goes in the di direction of the long run scars of supply shock story. And this uh, as for instance, also uh, raised by the paper by Fornar and Wolf. And um, what we see is that the COVID policy restrictions, we have a separate category for that as well, a country contributed to the, uh, to the adjustment of, of uh, innovation investment, but negatively. So at least for the sample of Germany, we do not see the pattern which was uh, flagged in the beginning of the pandemic of innovating yourself out of the pandemic. And um, crucially from the viewpoint of financial frictions, what we see is that basically financial frictions were very rarely a reason for the firms. And this is, in our view, an evidence of non-binding financial frictions. And this also has to be viewed in, the con in connection to the specific episode uh, and the policy support, which was basically characterized by large-scale direct transfers to the firm level and uh, through f basically direct fiscal transfers to firms in a rather timely manner, as well as, well as large-scale guarantee schemes and similar, and similar um, measures, which taken together means several things. First of all, like if you had seen amplification from the, from, from the financial side, uh, we would also have expected a much uh, stronger downward adjustment than the one that I just documented, which means um, that um, we interpret our results in that context as a, as a lower bound for how it could be, for instance, in a financial crisis. Now, um, yeah, so, and in general here, we decompose basically the share of firms which said that they experienced the demand shock and this was an the, the important, the central driver factor in the innovation choice and the reason to cut innovation investment. And vis-a-vis -vis those firms which, which simultaneously also stated that they uh, were suffering from financial constraints. And this is interesting from that angle because, I mean, we have seen a similar pattern also for the, for the Great Recession, but there often it's not clear whether it's demand or it's the role of financial frictions. But our results speak in favor that even a demand shock in its own, even without the propagations through the financial side, um, can lead um, to this pro-cyclical adjustment in innovation and through that, um, through the spillover to technology growth and um, me at least medium term aggregate supply. And uh, again, it also suggests that uh, the presence of financial frictions in turn can um, act as a substantial um, amplification mechanism um, to amplify the transmission from demand shocks to um, longer term aggregate supply. And um, yeah, so lastly, we also using here the role of expectations. Um, because as I said, we have uh, detailed information of what ex firms expected at the time they were undertaking these adjustments. And so we have expectations about whether they experienced, to, uh, they expect to have um, demand problems within the next half year starting from now, or whether they expect to be subject to financial f financing problems. And what we see here is that a firm which expects um, a, a demand problem over the next six months is 10% uh, more likely to uh, decrease uh, investment in R&D and 7.6% more likely to undertake cuts in the diffusion margin. And um, if a firm expects financing problems, so even if in that sample that we're showing, we do not um, expect, um, we do not see a direct role for financial frictions. If we do see that if a firm expects uh, ex uh, financing problems going forward, they cut innovation investment. So we do see this, um, this, uh, this role of financial frictions. We just also see that in this very specific episode, they just were not the main mechanism. And um, yeah, so 
I'll skip that and um, in the last five minutes or so that I have, we still, I still quickly also show what we do on the theory side. So we also basically to bring together the, um, with the um, patterns we see in the farm level um, and bring it to the aggregate dynamics. We also work with a new Keynesian DSG model, which has endogenous investment in innovation and technology growth and it's uh, uh, features endogenous TFP growth, basically using the, to, uh, the common and Gretler mechanism, and meaning that we have horizontal innovation through expanding varieties in intermediate goods. And um, we have two margins of technology growth. First of all, we have an R&D sector, which um, determines the, te the technological frontier. And on top of that, we have an endogenous diffusion process through costly technology adoption investment. And um, otherwise, we have a medium, we use a medium-scale DSG model set up in the spirit of Cristiano and Smets uh, 2005, and uh, Smets and Vouchers 2007. So we have um, carbon price and wage rigidities. Um, we have investment adjustment costs and monetary policy simply modeled in the form of a monetary policy rule. And um, here I'm focusing for the sake of time on the uh, transmission of the demand shock. Uh, and what we see here is we compare basically a model with endogenous technology, with endogenous in, in, in innovation in the blue line, uh, with um, a model with exogenous technology growth, as is typically the case in the, in the New Keynesian environment. And what we can see here is that whereas in a, in a, in a in, uh, in the standard New Keynesian model, you eventually revert to your initial output path. This is not the case, at least not instantaneously, under uh, endogenous growth. And because from here, a demand shock also depresses the uh, expected future profits from a new innovation, uh, from an intermediate good production line, and through that, um, ways on R&D investment and on technological diffusion investment, and through that you have a persistent effect on potential output and the longer term aggregate supply over at least the medium term. And um, yeah, so here we still also show a bit the role of the, of the crisis that we're talking about, because I guess we can all agree that it, the dynamics for the Great Recession are differently in terms of persistence and so on compared to the COVID episode. And here we basically compare V-shape versus L-shape um, recession. And what we see here is a potential amplification in case the shock in itself is long-lived and also an amplification through the supply side, through um, the cut in innovation investment. Now, um, we also, uh, of course, since we have like uh, information so from size and sectors, we also uh, can show the sector specifics here and the role of farm size. But as you can see, I mean, whereas of course, uh, we, we see substantially, uh, to some extent, a more pronounced uh, adjustment in the services side, um, but all in all, it's a rather balanced adjustment across, across, across different sectors. And in general, I mean, smaller firms are more likely, uh, for instance, to be also financially constrained. So as you can see in the lower panel, it's not a surprise that smaller firms on average adjust more. But then, of course, like thinking about aggregate, uh, aggregate TFP dynamics, so about aggregate investment, of course, like manufacturing also has a bigger role in innovation activities more generally. And um, also small, larger firms contribute more, so it's not clear ex ante uh, whether the, trans the, the mechanism is more importantly uh, operating through one sector or the other or through one size category or the other. And um, yeah, so bef I think well, we have more additional results coming up as well, but I think it's time to conclude for the time being. And um, yeah, so what we do is we show micro-level evidence uh, in favor that firms cut in, uh, investment in technology in a recession. We have a, we document a fall both in frontier innovation, R&D and non-frontier innovation in technological diffusion and through that document uh, a slowdown in technology growth at the firm level. Um, we show that the respective cuts are substantial, about 65% versus uh, for R&D and 70% for adoption. Um, we view this as firm level ev empirical evidence in favor that short run fluctuations, including demand shifts, uh, uh, transmit to innovation and hence to medium uh, aggregate supply or at least medium term aggregate supply. 
and uh, we view this as, as evidence in favor of uh, uh, substantial implications also for macroeconomic modeling and policy, which first of all means that, as we can see, in that policy support work to alleviate financial constraints and also towards uh, uh, alleviated degree of uh, innovation investment cuts, which says, uh, suggests that uh, stabilization policies can also have a role in preventing the persistent effects of recessions. And in more broadly, um, that the strict division of cycle and trend, this dichotomy, which is underlying many of um, the models we're using, for this, such as the New Keynesian model, um, may be treated with care in that context, and especially like the potential, uh, the concept of the potential output and uh, gap measures we typically employ. That's all I have at this point. Thanks. Thank you, Mihaela. Uh, just on time, perfectly on time. And Paloma, you have 15 minutes. Okay. Can you hear me, everybody? So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for having me in the program today. Uh, thank you to Mihaela for the excellent paper. Always a pleasure reading her. Thank you to all of you for being here. I mean, this is the last mile or last kilometer of the, <laughs> of the conference, and you made it good for you. So, I mean, we'll, we'll do our best um, to wake you up and, and, and make it together to, to in the last mile. So, um, in my discussion, um, I'm going to start not by summarizing the paper, because she, Mihaela did a great go, uh, job in, in, in really putting together all the main resources of the paper. So I'm going to tell you my main takeaways. <coughs> and then I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of major points that I had while reading the paper, um, um, which I know is, is still ongoing progress, and maybe they can be taken on board for the revised version of the paper. So um, first of all, this is um, a paper that contributes to the strand of literature that shows the short-term shocks, demand shocks, can have long-term implications. And this is a very important literature. There is part of it that, lo that looks at the scarring impacts of the crisis on the labor market. And then there is another strand of literature that looks at the impact of demand shocks on investment in innovation, TFP growth, and therefore on uh, long-term growth. Now, this paper has a very cool empirical part that is based on um, survey data from Germany, from a representative sample of firms uh, in Germany that answer questions about planned investment in innovation and then executed investment in innovation, which is really a very cool way of identifying what is the impact of the crisis on uh, the decisions of the firms, optimal decisions of the firms in terms of, of R&D and, and technology adoption. Um, the um, one thing that I found really interesting also of the survey results was that it it, it shows that expectations about future demand shocks are also playing a very important role in terms of the investment decisions of the, of the firms on innovation. So it's not only the current demand shock that we are suffering, and this is um, uh, uh, making firms rethinking about their optimal strategy in terms of investment in innovation, but it's also the expectation in terms of demand or financial constraints. Um, and then, as you saw, the availability of finance is really a mitigating factor for the negative impact of the demand shock on the decisions of investment in innovation. There is a sizable share of firms that say, I am affected by the shock, but I'm not going to change my investment decisions because I have sufficient finance. There is also um, a, an interesting result which says uh, it's a very small share of firms that say the major driver of the decrease in investment in innovation is the lack of finance. The, the, actually, the most important factor is uncertainty, and then is the, the drop in demand. Now, the thing that I really like the most of this survey is that it asks not only about investment on R&D, but also investment on technology adoption. And why is this very, very important? Leo is here, so I mean, I'm, I'm saying something that he knows and you all know. But, you know, investment in R&D is really concentrated on few firms. I have here a table from the EU Industrial R&D Investment Scoreboard, and it says that basically the 10% top investors in R&D concentrate 70% 
of the investment in R&D. So really, the aggregate impact of innovation is going to depend very much also on how this innovation is um, spreading through the economy. And this is going to depend on how firms are adapting or adopting the new innovations into their production processes. And we know there is a lot of evidence on that, that this technology diffusion is actually slowing down in Europe, and this is one of the causes of the very poor TFP growth that we are, that we are experiencing. I'm uh, showing here a chart that is defining technology diffusion as the gap between TFP growth of frontier firms who are actually doing the R&D, and uh, laggard firms here defined as the median firm in the sector, and you can see that above all in services, this gap is increasing over time. So technology diffusion is slowing, so anything that helps us really understanding why this is the case and above all, what is the impact of shocks on technolo technology diffusion and not only on investment in R&D is really welcome. Now, um, this is the slide on questions on the survey and my main question is how representative is the COVID-induced crisis in terms of crisis? So, uh, um, can we really generalize the findings of this survey? And I'm asking this because there are three characteristics of the COVID-induced crisis that could be driving some of the results of the survey, and they are really not general to other crises. The first one is that the COVID was really the first time we all experienced a pandemic. There was a lot of uncertainty. We had no idea when the vaccination was coming in, when we were you know, going to be able to return to work, when we were going to be able to return to our normal life. So maybe that's why uncertainty plays such a really big role in the changing plans in the of the corporate sector, and maybe that's also why um, expectations have such a big impact, in my, in my opinion, on the investment plans of, of the firms. The second characteristic, which is really not normal, in terms of previous crises of the COVID-induced crisis was the very uh, generous and huge and widespread liquidity support to the corporate sector. And maybe this is what is driving the relatively small uh, role of financial constraints in the resource of the survey. The third characteristic is actually firms needed to invest in technology adoption during the crisis because they needed to adopt all these technologies to increase the connectivity between the firms and the workers in order to enable teleworking. Okay, and there is therefore a very um, counterintuitive result that uh, Michaela didn't show that says that during the crisis there was a substantial share of firms that increased investment in technology adoption. So this is my main point. How can we, or can we really generalize these results to other crises? Then I have two very small points. One of them relates to the fact that um, uh, the survey finds that the decrease in investment in innovation um, is similar both in manufacturing and in services. And I was a bit puzzled with this result because, of course, at least in 2020, manufacturing firms were much less affected by the shock than services uh, firms. But then I thought, you know, services is um, including many different types of activities. On the one hand, we have the contact intensive services, and the other hand, we have health services. The contact intensive services maybe suffered a big decrease in investment plans, but the health services had to increase the investment in innovation. So maybe if we could disentangle these different types of services, we could, we could get a better view on the sector differential impact of, of the shock. And then, and this is not really talking to the objective of the paper, this is talking to my own uh, uh, worries and questions. Um, my question is whether we could use the survey results to really understand better what makes certain firms invest in technology adoption and other firms optimally not invest in technology adoption. I think it's really important that we better understand uh, why technology is diffusing so slow in the, in the economy. Now, let me move to the, to the model. So the uh, mechanism at work in the model is that a transitory demand shock uh, is going to lower expected payoff of the R&D and the technology adoption relative to the cost of the investment. And this is turning uh, investment in innovation and technology adoption pro-cyclical. It's going to reduce GFP growth permanently and it's going to turn the uh, long-term uh, GDP growth uh, uh, is going to make it below or go below the pre-crisis trend. 
Um, while reading this paper, I was thinking that there is an alternative mechanism that could, that could actually um, work and could deliver certainly uh, uh, some different results under certain assumptions. And this is what we call the opportunity cost theory. This, this theory was uh, very much discussed in a paper by St. Paul in 1997, also Guillaume et al. in 2008. And it is based on the fact that firms have limited resources and they have to decide whether to invest these resources on current production or on future production. And to increase future production, you have to invest in productivity enhancing activities. And in the theory, the cost of this investment in productivity enhancing activities basically is foregone output today. So what happens is that when there is a transitory demand shock, the, this is going to reduce reduce the opportunity cost of productivity enhancing activities because what I'm going to get from my production today is going to go down because my sales are going down. Therefore, the foregone output of investing for the future is going to go down. So optimally, the firms are going to decide to increase the share of R&D in total investment. So it turns counter cyclical. But the theory goes, you know, um, firms might need external finance to finance the productivity enhancing activities. And if my current revenues are going down, my ability to borrow might go down as well. And this means that the uh, share of R&D investment is going to turn pro-cyclical for credit constrained firms. So in this um, uh, model, if you want, it's very, very important that there are limited resources that uh, firms are, sometimes have to uh, go to external finance to uh, finance the investment in, in, in innovation. And the uh, cyclical position of the economy is going to condition that. So from here, I have three questions because if I understood it correctly, in the model, we don't see how firms are actually financing the investment. There, there is nothing talks to that. And um, uh, so far, and, and I'm sure that this will be included in the future, there are no financial constraints. So I was thinking maybe we can model access to external finance as a function of the collateral of the firm. And this would mean that small firms have uh, more difficulties in accessing this external finance, which is talking to the survey results. We also could bring a role for monetary policy in, in the paper in, in order to stabilize and to help uh, going through, through the crisis. Um, the other question I had is, what is the relative cost of the different types of investment? Is um, investment in R&D more expensive than investment in, in technology adoption? Does it make a difference? Does, does this make a difference? And the last part is what, parts, what, what happens with the other investments on, on fixed assets? Is there any kind of substitution? So my main comment here in the model is um, we have to understand how the investment is financed and whether all firms can um, finance the investment uh, without constraints. Um, and, and I think that if um, uh, do include that in the model, it could really deliver interesting dynamics. And I'm going to leave it here. Thank you very much. So, Mihaela, do you want to respond to Paloma? Sure, uh, <laughs> before I forget it. So, thank you very much for reading the paper and for the very important comments. So, um, maybe I'll start actually backward because that I have fresh in my memory. So, about the model. So, again, like whether firms adjust upward or downward, I mean, in the, in the survey, we see it clearly. We have some firms which may have experienced actually also a positive shock because, I mean, as we know, there was, was, was an unbalanced crisis altogether. So we do see some evidence of upward adjustment, but first of all, both in the extensive margin, how, much, uh, how many firms adjust and also how much they adjust on average. The tendency, no, it's not tendency, so the evidence clearly goes into negative, so on average, as we've seen, like 750,000 for R&D, and this clearly outweighs the, the respective increases, which are very minor. So the aggregate downward adjustment in response to the crisis is clearly negative. This is also why in the model we consider uh, mechanisms uh, which are consistent with the data, what we find, because I mean, what we see in the data is clearly 
the pro-cyclical pattern for R&D investment and for technological diffusion. So this is why we also have used a model which captures that. So basically, uh, the role of the model is to work out the aggregate dynamics and to speak a little bit about um, the role for macro modeling and so on. And in that sense, it's also not completely new because I mean, there are other frameworks who have worked with this mechanism before, but I mean, we wanna bring it in the context of the of the macro dynamics here, but I mean, in, in, in a way, I mean, also between these alternative mechanisms, which would give a counter cyclical response of TFP. So we see. So of investment in R&D relative to total investment. So that means that the R&D is going to decrease less than other investment. It could decrease, but less than other investment of the share. But that's maybe, not. Maybe it was not clear. But that's not so. That that's not really the question we're answering here. So we're focusing on technology enhancing investment only. Um, so, and then about the role of financial constraints, I mean, we could think of a model which would have a, maybe an ad hoc uh, financial friction in there, and then we would get an amplification of the demand shock. I mean, we can think of ways of, of doing this. Um, what else? Oh, about the role of monetary policy, I mean, in this framework, even in the absence of financial frictions, you do have a role for monetary policy, and that comes also through the demand side, basically through the mm. breakdown of uh, long-run non-neutrality in this setting. Um, then um, um, about COVID, uh, how to what extent this is general, generalizable? Well, um, I mean, this is... Uh, understandable how, how one might think that way because I mean the crisis is perceived as very exceptional in many ways but then kind of most crises are when they arise so this is this is a cheap way of responding to it but I mean first of all um, about the role of uncertainty I mean we can that's the nice part about this survey that we can actually account for expectations and we can also put a number on it what they expect so this is some some way we can even control for uh, in the estimates that I have shown. And um, we have very detailed uh, information also on the liquidity support, which we can use in the, in the estimates. And um, in general, with respect to the increase, I just said, like we also see some firms which increase, but again on aggregate, and also for each of the firms that adjust, it's, it's a small margin, it's small compared to the increase or decreases. And um, actually with manufacturing, and this is actually a good point that you brought it up because in the new version of the paper, we're also adding a little bit the context of the crisis. And there I wanna emphasize that in 2020, actually manufacturing dropped a lot in Germany. So this is comparable to the extent you know, during, the great, during the great recession. So from that angle, it's um, uh, not so surprising that we see a lot of adjustment also in manufacturing. And in general, I mean, talking about aggregate uh, implications, uh, you see a bigger role than in the end, uh, also how manufacturing contributes to aggregate innovation investment. So I'm not sure if I now responded to everything, but if not, then we talk about it later. Thank you very much again. Okay. So that gives us time for, I think, uh, for questions, I think Diego was first, and for the online audience, just <laughs> say who you are because they don't <laughs> see you. Yeah. Um, Diego Comin from Dartmouth College. I um, <laughs> would like to first comment on one comment that Paloma made in her excellent discussion about this opportunity cost. Um, the reason why you get this possibility of countercyclic R and D is because you know the. The cyclicality of the cost of doing R&D is greater than the cost of the, the benefits from doing R&D, which is the profits in the models. Um, of course, in the data, that's not the case. Wages are very are, are not very procyclical, and profits are extremely procyclical. So the models underestimate the procyclicality of the model of, of profits and, and overestimate the the, the 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 cyclicality of of wages, and that's why you get the reverse result of what you see in the data, which is that R&D is very procyclical. So um, I, I would like to push back against that, that, that way of thinking. Um, on, on the paper, I think it's very interesting. Uh, many years ago, I looked at the Mannheim Innovation Survey, and there like you, you have a measure of um, innovations that are uh, new to the firm, but not new to the markets, which mm -hmm. is basically like you're bringing things that exist out there. And that was also very procyclical uh, in the time of the, of the Great Recession. Um, I would like to echo Paloma's comments about the abnormality of COVID. Um, you know, together with some co-authors of the World Bank, we have been looking at the adoption of a specific technologies mm -hmm. during COVID in various countries. 
Uh, and what we have found is that actually COVID fostered the adoption of those technologies, especially in companies that already had some, some preconditions to continue adopting technologies and then COVID hit and they were the first ones to adopt. So, so you know, probably this is not the best time in the world to draw conclusions about these channels that can be generalized to other periods. Um, here, another question. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation, Philip Hartmann, ECB. Uh, three points. So, uh, first of all, um, you didn't talk much about your theoretical model, more about the empirical results, but you know that in the times of continuous structural change that we face like now, uh, how important I find your work to combine endogenous growth work with new Keynesian work, which allows us to uh, overcome a bit too drastic separation between business cycles and growth in such situations where we have continuous growth continuous structural change uh, going on. Um, and actually, we had a discussion this morning about the potential extensions of the new Keynesian climate model, and actually that extension would be on top of my list. Why? Because a huge influential factor on the climate transition is the innovation gap. And uh, so I do think that that has to be an inherent part of the different paths uh, that we can have uh, in the climate transition and therefore in that model would be very useful I believe to add these features that you have. Second point, so as several people have said, so um, I looked at your graph from the German recessions, there are three, there's the dot com one, early 2000s, there's the great financial crisis and there's the COVID. So uh, they're all special, not only the COVID, they're all very special. So the, arguably the first one had a lot to do with um, the technology bubble, actually, among other things. The second with a very peculiar financial uh, developments and the last was just discussed very peculiar in, in, in other respects. So that makes me think that thinking about the uh, innovation developments um, it may not, given that the data are that they are, the recessions are that they are, actually one would want to complement that research with a more continuous view on investment and innovation and growth. Because um, you, you actually, it's, there are so few, three only since uh, 28 years or something like that. And then each of them is very special. So, um, so we need to complement that with a more continuous view also in the up and the um, and in the downside, and if you think about that, I don't know whether it was mentioned on the COVID one, there was also some sectors that had a huge innovation boom, you know, like uh, for the peculiarity of the crisis. Um, now, I, you know, I realize that that may not be the end of the story in the aggregate, of course, in with many shutdowns, but still, it was a recession where there were some sectors that had uh, historical uh, innovation booms, no, um, and. That uh, enters also the picture for this other view on recessions that we know since earlier of the 20th century about, uh, you know, like a more Schumpeterian view. So that I would find very useful to include. I'm not saying that the recessions we're talking about are Schumpeterian and actually they, they, they prepared the ground for the future prosperity necessarily, but it has to be on the, on, on the radar screen. Last, last point um, on the more current developments. If you look at the recession in Germany after the dot-com bubble, um, then uh, arguably an overinvestment in certain technologies or an over, yeah, overinvestment, don't know, financial, real, I'm not sure, the proportions, may have been part of the picture. And if you look at the stock markets today, then you see that most of the booms in the stock market, these illogical booms, is driven by the Magnificent Seven companies in the uh, in the US and um, uh, so-called granolas in Europe, which are all these technology firms around digitalization, AI, and so on. So there's a, there's a distinct risk uh, also of, there could be a, a backlash, no? like uh, if there was a correction of this and uh, innovation, that this uh, investment innovation enthusiasm, we could have uh, a downward factor uh, uh, coming in the, in the current situation. So, Again, I, I do think it would be valuable to include these possibilities in the kind of modeling and, and empirical analysis. Um, but thank you, very nice paper. We are out of time, Philip, but I would like to allow for one question more. Here. 
Yeah, Dimitri. Sorry, I'll try and be quick. It's just um, in terms of longer horizon responses, because COVID was a V-shaped recession, so the economy recovered quickly. But I wonder for you, R&D, did it bounce back or maybe even overshoot afterwards to compensate for the initial decline? Okay. Uh, one question. Yeah. Quickly, so much of the innovation literature has been about the extent to which a firm can overtake a le an incumbent and promote innovation that way. With your data, could you actually document a little bit, like is it the small firms, the more incumbents, to what extent you see that these recessions are leading to more um, creative destruction, I guess, <laughs> but just more generally, what happens to patterns of competition and who's doing the R&D or not? Because one might think that that would, something that you can actually do with your data that would be very informative. Okay, uh, there are no other questions. I Did you write all the <laughs> questions there? I hope so. So yeah. thank you very much for all of the questions and comments. So um, we can look, uh, for instance, I mean, one thing we can do, we can also look into the plans and then kind of give a bit of a, an anatomy of the landscape of the innovators ac across both margins. That could be one. Then for yours, um, we, we have the data also following uh, 21, 22, 23. This is what we're currently doing documenting this on the firm level to think of the, the patterns you had in mind. Um, then about uh, Diego's comment, so um, so actually what we, so we should look into into what you were referring to and what we also be related to what you said, so we also do see some firms which increase. This may be, for instance, those that you were referring to as well, but it's again like on the aggregate, the share of those which downward adjusted and then also the magnitude they adjusted outweighs the other patterns. I'm not saying that there's no evidence at all in favor of this channel in, 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 in our data either. And actually with the Mannheim Innovation Survey, we're looking now also, in, uh, so we also have that data and we're showing it over a longer period of time, also to link it, for instance, to the magnitude and the deviation of plans versus investment. During the, during, the, during the Great Recession, and this also links it a bit to, to Philip's comment. Um, so we're showing, and currently updated, we're uh, uh, currently updating the, the paper, and in this one we're also showing, comparing the magnitude and the deviation of plans versus adjustments compared to previous crisis episodes in Germany. I mean, it's, it's a model or, and also an exercise of, N of uh, it's not really a, a, a paper on firm dynamics of entry versus exit, but again, like and most adjustment we see is on the intensive margin of investment here as well. And um, about the role of cl uh, climate and endogenous growth in a, in a new Keynesian framework, so this would be an interesting angle, and we have at some point also discussed this. Um, to incorporate for these channels where usually the trend or innovation part is basically fixed and exogenous. And um, uh, yeah, so I mean, Schumpeterian dynamics is not something we can do with this data set, but this is something, an, another important mechanism. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much.